Oh, I'm Mark Mandika, co-founder and executive director of the Amphibian Foundation. I'm here today to talk with you about global amphibian declines and the amphibian extinction crisis. First, I thought I'd tell you about the Amphibian Foundation itself, which formed in 2016 to focus on the conservation of amphibians, uh, particularly in the southeastern United States, but also across the globe, trying to wait, raise awareness for the uh, amphibian extinction crisis. If you're not aware, amphibians uh, include frogs, like this spotted glass frog, salamanders, and here is a palm salamander, and Sicilians, a limbless amphibian that resembles a worm or a snake, but they are amphibians. They are uh, vertebrates, fossorial animals that live under the ground, so they're extremely secretive and not much is known about them. We try to highlight them whenever we can because look how cool they are. My background is primarily in wetlands like this one right here. Forested swampy depressions known as vernal ponds, seasonal ponds, temporary ponds, uh, ephemeral wetlands. Um, I like to call them puddles because basically that's what it is. That's what they look like. And that's what you think of when you see a wetland like this. These ephemeral wetlands range in size. Sometimes they can be quite large. Here's one in south uh, western Georgia where we release gopher frogs. Here's that same wetland at a different time of year. I have been working in these types of, of wetlands for over 20 years, starting in Massachusetts where they remain relatively frozen during some of the breeding months. And then I went um, to Everglades National Park for four years in uh, the portion of the park where I worked, Long Pine Key, functions like a huge ephemeral wetland because basically it's entirely dry for part of the year and it's entirely wet for part of the year. Um, so a little bit of background. Now I want to get into the reason of the talk is that amphibians are disappearing as of this year. 43% uh, of amphibian species are documented as in decline or already extinct. They're disappearing from everywhere, not just developed areas, but even very remote, pristine areas. And there are multiple causes that have been documented as causing these declines. The last time we saw such a group disappear was with these things, the dinosaurs. That's the last time we lost an entire group of animals at such a rate. So one thing I wanted to talk about is why should we care? That's a question I'm often asked when I'm engaging with the public and usually what I start with is that amphibians do a lot for us, including they eat a lot of bugs. Five million uh, insects are eaten by 1,000 frogs every year. Some species like this one here, the marbled salamander, specialize in eating mosquitoes. Here, watch. So obviously they're doing a great job for us. Amphibians also play a vital part of the food web. So we already mentioned they eat insects, but a lot of animals prey on the amphibians as well. Um, frogs, salamanders, they're eaten by a large variety of predators, birds, snakes, other amphibians, uh, mammals, all rely on amphibians for food. Amphibians, due to their skin, are very sensitive to changes in the environment. Uh, the amphibian skin is key for the amphibians. A lot of their respiration occurs through their skin. Their water balance is maintained through their skin. Um, and anything that we've put into the environment is absorbed into the amphibian through the skin. So that fact alone they uh, respond very quickly to imbalances in the environment. They've been on Earth for millions of years. They predate the dinosaurs, uh, and they have adapted to exist in all types of environments, even ones where you would never expect to find an amphibian. Lastly, I'd like to mention that they are uh, useful for human health. Um, the compounds in an amphibian skin are, are quite interesting. There's lots of uh, pharmaceutical benefits in the skin 
of an amphibian. For example, there is a poison frog from Ecuador. The secretions of their skin is more effective than morphine at relieving pain and non-addictive. Next, I wanted to talk to you about some of the imperiled species that we work with here in Georgia. Endangered, threatened, and a con uh, species of concern. If you're interested, you can go to our website at research.amphibianfoundation.org and learn more about the specific research programs where we've initiated with and partner with at the Amphibian Foundation. But our first priority started with the frosted flatwood salamander. It's a beautiful species which used to be quite common across the southeastern coastal plain and now is restricted to a handful of wetlands. In 2008, flatwood salamanders were split into two species. It used to be just one. Uh, they are vir virtually indiscernible from each other, uh, except through genetics. Here are some of the partners that we work with on this project um, fighting against the extinction of the flatwood salamander. Uh, both species of flatwood salamanders have suffered a 90% loss of population since 1999. And to give you a little example of what that looks like, here's the historic range of the species prior, prior to 1999. Uh, as you can see, they extend from South Carolina all the way through the Georgia coastal plain and into northern Florida. Here's their current range. And I'll zoom in on that a little bit. Just a handful of wetlands left. The northernmost uh, orange dot there in South Carolina, they haven't been found there in over 10 years, uh, but it's still surveyed every year. So we're keeping the dot on for now and hopeful that we'll find something. Here's an example of uh, some of the teams we've been able to put together uh, every year looking for these things. And our primary target is the last known site in Georgia. And this is where this picture was taken at Fort Stewart Army Base, Liberty County. Typically, when we're looking for flatwood salamanders, we're going after the larvae. That is the most easy, easy life stage to find these things. They're incredibly secretive. Uh, as adults, you basically would only be able to find them during their migration, which lasts a very short period of time. Their eggs are also very difficult to find. But if you go out into a wetland with dip nets and survey the ponds quite rigorously, you can typically find them if you look hard enough. Here is one that we've detected at Fort Stewart. So uh, the Amphibian Foundation has the world's only permit to collect this species in the wild. And we have a rearing facility here in Atlanta. Uh, this is a view of inside the salamander lab where we raise uh, salamanders to adult and individual enclosures. Uh, that way we can monitor their health very carefully. One way that we um, rear these things is through um, salvaging eggs. So flatwood salamanders lay their eggs in ponds, uh, vernal ponds, ephemeral wetlands, but only when they're dry. The salamanders lay their eggs in the ponds when they're dry. They leave, the adults leave, the eggs will sit there and develop and wait for rains to come and fill their ponds and that's when they hatch. Uh, the last few years, however, the rains have not come and eggs were drying out in the field. So Florida Fish and Wildlife started a new program to actually go flag these eggs and collect them before they just flat out died. If it looked like they weren't going to get the rain they needed, the eggs were collected. And a portion of the eggs were brought to the Amphibian Foundation. So in 2017, we uh, uh, collected 344 eggs from Florida Fish and Wildlife. So these were all eggs that were well past the time where they should have gotten water and hatched. Uh, once they got to the lab, we very carefully pulled them out one at a time with a spoon. 
And as soon as we put like a single drop of water on them, they hatched. They were just ready. So we were able to get all 344 to hatch. So here's one in a spoon. That's a teaspoon uh, with a little flatwood salamander larvae in it. Here's an amazing picture uh, by Pearson Hill. He took of one in situ out in the wild uh, where you can see one and how their uh, patterning helps them blend in with the flooded grasslands that they live in. Here's one of our lab reared larvae. Uh, here's one right at metamorphosis, so you can still see it has its larval stripes, but it's beginning to get its adult patterning in as well. And here are some that are being released. Uh, these are head started animals where um, animals are reared just for release back out at the wetland from where they came. And then here's one that just metamorphosed and is taking its very first steps. And I just thought it was very cute and clumsy. So uh, over the last few years at the Amphibian Foundation, we've really mastered the art of uh, rearing up these eggs through uh, the larval stage, through metamorphosis, and rearing up big beefy adults. So now we're focused on a captive breeding program where we are uh, going to produce larvae for release back out into the wild. And this is definitely a species we feel strongly about and they're worth saving. And look at that face. Another species we work with is the gopher frog. Um, this is Georgia's rarest frog. They live in a lot of the same habitats as the flatwood salamander, which is the longleaf pine savanna. Here are some of the partners we work with. And um, I personally, through um, a couple of different jobs have been head starting gopher frogs for about 11 years. So I've gotten to release oof, probably thousands of gopher frogs at this point. Here's a bunch of baby gopher frogs right before release. So when you're head starting them, you collect the eggs from the wild, you rear them up uh, through their larval stage. So you just have lots of tubs of gopher frog tadpoles. And then once they metamorphose, we release the baby frogs back out into the wild. And that's thought to give them an edge over things that like to eat tadpoles where they're very uh, sensitive and uh, sitting ducks for predators. And if you rear them up to a young froglet stage, they have a better chance. Thing is, is that once they metamorphose, they like to start eating each other. So you have to house them in individual cups uh, before you release them. So there they are being held uh, until we, they could be released. And uh, this uh, blurry picture here is the first egg mass ever produced by frogs that we've released through this Head Start program. So and this was in 2013. So if you just think about this, in Georgia's rarest frog, we've been just releasing thousands of frogs out at this wetland. Uh, in 2013, we started hearing calls. So that's evidence that some of our gopher frogs had at least reached adulthood because only the adult male frogs will call. Uh, and then later that same year, we found our first clutch of gopher frog eggs, which is some really good sign um, that they're acclimating and establishing their own population. Uh, that said, a couple of years ago, it was, uh, it was determined that the gopher frog is still declining in the state. So we switched our focus from head starting to captive breeding. Well, instead of collecting eggs from the wild, uh, we're focused on producing eggs at our facility in Atlanta. So here is the other co-founder of the Amphibian Foundation, Crystal, holding a gopher frog. And this was the day we released some adult frogs into our mesocosms. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. Another species we're working with is the striped newt. Here are our partners working with us on the striped newt project. This is particularly exciting because in 2018, 
was the first time that we released animals that were born at the Amphibian Foundation back out into the wild. So there are more striped newts now than there were when we started, and that's a very exciting uh, prospect. Here are some of our baby newts just before release. Um, before we release striped newts, first they get a little tattoo. Here's the tattoo team from last year. Uh, on, the, on the bottom of the picture, you can see the tattoo regime there where the animals are color coded so we can tell what year they were released and what in, uh, institution they were born at. And here's one of our newts as it's getting released. And we feel very good about these newts. <laughs> we love them. <clears throat> so another species we're working with is the spotted salamander. And this is a species that uh, is, is partially responsible for me being the way I am. It's the first species I researched, uh, and it was as an undergrad in Massachusetts uh, working with this. And here in uh, the Georgia Piedmont, we have these spotted salamanders. You may, uh, they're not uncommon, and you may have seen them, or maybe not, because they're extremely secretive. They're really only active for 50, uh, two, two weeks of the year. The other 50 weeks, they're underneath stuff or underground and very hard to find. Um, so even though they are common, they are not doing well inside of the metro region. So we have a very local conservation project for this species here. Here's a, a young spotted salamander, and they are adorable. Um, through our uh, citizen science program and our surveys, we've only detected spotted salamanders at two breeding sites inside of Metro Atlanta. Working with partners at the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve, we were able to establish them at a third site. What I mean by establish is we've been releasing animals at a, in a, a restored habitat right in Metro Atlanta uh, for a few years. And, but for the last two or three years, we've actually been finding eggs every year. So the animals were released have reached adulthood and are now returning to the ephemeral wetland to breed. Um, we're trying a similar project at the Atlanta History Center. Uh, every March during the Atlanta Science Festival, we lead a salamander stroll. And so we get about, well, I don't know, maybe up to 40 people out there to see salamanders and um, uh, spotted salamander eggs and, and redback salamanders and slimy salamanders and two-line salamanders. And so it's a, it's a great uh, opportunity for us to share our salamander love with the public. Another species we focus on is the tiger salamander because, you know, look at that face. Uh, tiger salamanders have recently been added to the state's uh, wildlife action plan. So we're starting to get concerned about uh, tiger salamanders. The mole salamander is another adorable beast. Um, you know, it's another species that is not doing very well in the metro region. So they're uh, doing fine throughout most of its range on the uh, eastern seaboard, but uh, in metro Atlanta we're concerned. And that also fits the description for the marbled salamander, which uh, was undoubtedly common here at one point, but we've only been able to find them at one site inside the metro region. We're also working with ring salamanders, which is a, a beautiful species. They are not a Georgia native. They're a little bit more west. These particular animals that are in our collection are from Missouri, but they are the closest relative to flatwood salamanders. So we're trying to, trying to do uh, learn as much as we can about the reproductive biology of this species and hoping anything we can learn we can use as uh, we investigate reproducing uh, flatwood salamanders. Uh, one of our uh, biggest facilities uh, at the foundation is the Amphibian Research and Conservation Center. And this is an outdoor facility that we've built on the Blue Heron Nature Preserve, which is where we're located. It's uh, 30 acres of nature preserve inside of Atlanta. Uh, and we um, are headquartered there. 
as well as Blue Heron Nature Preserve and the Atlanta Audubon Society. Um, so first we set up these cattle tanks. So these are 33 gallon tubs that are used to water cattle. Uh, and then we converted them into these triphasic mesocosms. Uh, mesocosm is like a mid-sized miniature experimentally controllable wetland. We have 33 of these. Uh, has the wetland portion, the upland portion, and the ecotone, which is the graduation between the wetland and the upland. And that's an essential part of breeding frosted flatwood salamanders because that's where they lay their eggs in the ecotone. So here's a view. And uh, here you can just about see all 33 of them. Uh, we have some uh, signage out there because this is the city of Atlanta Park. Uh, these are trails that are open to the public and people can come and learn about these uh, animals and learn about what we're trying to do to conserve them. So if you remember, I showed you the salamander lab where we rear frosted flatwood salamanders and they're all individually reared. But uh, when it comes time to release them, they're all put together. Um, here are a bunch of our uh, lab reared. Uh, these are adults now. And then here are some of our year old salamanders and watch the one right in the middle. He's about to, yep, there he goes. <laughs> So uh, these salamanders have been released out into these mesocosms where they're hopefully going to grow, uh, become reproductively active, and, and produce some eggs for us um, maybe as early as this December. We also focus on the amphibians right here in Atlanta. One of the ways we do this is through a community science program called the Metro Atlanta Amphibian Monitoring Program, or MAMP. Uh, the website for the MAMP is right here at the top left. And we have a very comprehensive website going through all 28 species of amphibian that are found in this area. We have species accounts. We have images of all 28 species in adult, juvenile, metamorph larval and egg phases. Uh, we have the frog calls for all 14 species of frog that you can play or download. Um, and we're, uh, we lead workshops, um, usually about four year free workshops to help people get acquainted with their neighborhood amphibians and, and become surveyors for our community science program. We have about 34 sites inside of Metro Atlanta that are monitored monthly. It's through these uh, MAP surveys that we found the one known breeding location for marbled salamanders inside of Metro Atlanta. This is a particularly beautiful species. Um, they're also very interesting in that they lay their eggs on land, just like the flatwood salamander. And that's what all those BBs are. Those are eggs. Uh, marbled salamanders guard the eggs. Female marbled salamanders are larger and their markings are grayer than the smaller and whiter males. So you can see here's a pair, um, and she's guarding her eggs from predation and also uh, making sure that they don't dry out. So those are our conservation programs. Uh, Amphibian Foundation also has a significant number of educational programs uh, for all ages. So. We, uh, we really believe that we can have no true lasting impact unless we get more people on board in conservation or at least uh, mindful about being stewards for the environment. So we really uh, spend a lot of time engaging and educating the public about amphibians and amphibian declines and, and what you can do uh, to protect the amphibians in your area. Uh, we have an extensive volunteer and intern training program. Uh, as of today, we have 94 volunteers and interns working with us on various projects. So we, uh, we do invest a lot of time in training. We uh, offer a lot of courses. We teach amphibian biology, reptile biology, you know, 
um, conservation courses and illustration and that's what this picture is from a illustration uh, course at Georgia Tech that I help instruct every year and I just love this picture because everyone everyone in the picture is clearly enamored by that spotted salamander um, we teach biology of the amphibians every fall semester at Agnes Scott College. That's through the continuing education program, so it's open to all. It's typically uh, taught on the weekends. And biology of the reptiles, also at Agnes Scott, where I am a lecturer, uh, spring semesters. We teach biology of the reptiles. Uh, we teach a master herpetologist program. Uh, at the Amphibian Foundation and online, and we do that in partnership with Georgia DNR, uh, the Orient Society, and a turtle biologist at the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, and then we have our Critters and Cabernet. So uh, we do a lot of programs for kids, and the parents were always like, what about us? Uh, so we started this uh, monthly meeting at the Foundation where uh, you can chill, learn about these cool animals and then get to play with some of them. Our most comprehensive program is the Bridge Program for Conservation Research. Uh, this is a one to three semester program focusing on providing mentored experimental and research experience in the field focusing on critical conservation initiatives. Um, so there's lots of field work um, there's lots of uh, other opportunities as well um, to work hands-on with uh, endangered and imperiled species, work in protected habitat, uh, work in a variety of disciplines or concentrations, and just provide a lot of skills in a very intensive but also supported and mentored uh, environment. So uh, for more information on that program, you can just go to bridge.amphibianfoundation.org and learn more about what we have to offer there. And then lastly, you know, I just uh, want to go over our programs for kids because, you know, our first program was called or is called Critter Camp. And Critter Camp um, meets mostly in the summer, but we do some work uh, during the school year as well. And it's a, just a reptile and amphibian camp where we focus on uh, education, but also lots of quality handling time and observation time and feeding time and uh, it's just been a very popular program for us so we had 330 campers last year for example and so um, that, that uh, to me that's just that's a lot and mind-blowing that so many people want to take the camp and come back to it and then we're at the point now where some of the older kids are coming back to be counselors and training and that feels really good so um, yeah here's a list of our programs that we offer for kids uh, so they tend to have the word critter in them critter camp critter club is our after school club uh, and then we do other programs as well so we are very committed to having a lot of opportunities to get involved um, so you know depending on how much interest you have or uh, where you want to go from there or how much time you have available we have ways to engage people in a variety of ways, even if it's just ways to make your yard more amphibian friendly. Um, we have links there to all of our different programs and would encourage you to join our mailing list as well. And I'd ask for questions, but seeing as this is a pre-recorded video, I wouldn't be able to answer them anyway, but you can definitely send me questions to this email here mark at amphibianfoundation.org uh, that's my little boy Anthony holding a frog that just had his uh, right leg amputated so that's a sad story but then 
where the way he's holding it with his shirt there instead of a three-legged frog it looks like it's some crazy five-legged frog or something like that anyway if you're interested there's literature available at the website down at the bottom there and again there's my email address and phone number if you have any questions and i thank you for your time and interest okay